thing that happened to me kind of was happening to another colleague where um, there's a specific certification when you get your 8A, for example, which is a federal mm. certified, um, and their certification was expiring. Well, my other colleague just got their certification. And so the idea was, you know what, maybe you two can parlay and collaborate as you're offboarding your certification, talk to your client, get them to introduce to my new, my other um, colleague, and then you two can work together, keep the contract, right? Work together. Because one of the things with 8A, you want to have past performance, right? But your new 8A, you didn't even know where to go get the business. That takes time in itself. And so now I've just given you business right there from an existing colleague that was graduating. So I felt like that was very helpful. At least I thought I was being helpful. <laughs> um, but it did give past performance. And it's always helpful to had past performance. Um, and so I thought that was a very good value. Hello and welcome to another episode of CSA's Flap Space. My name is Amy CSA and today we have Sequoia Ramsey, president of Realistic Computing. Sequoia, thanks for joining me today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so first and foremost, let's talk about your company, right? Because that's how we met. We are both Microsoft partners and we both provide consulting services to a number of different organizations. But um, I would love for you to give an introduction of um, who you are and your company. Thank you, Amy. I'm Sequoia Ramsey, and what I'm about is everything technology and everything customer. So we're very um, realistic computing is a customer centric company, um, and we provide products and services um, that allow our customers to leverage technology, specifically in um, application development, um, AV, audio visual services, and in our traditional um, information technology services. Nice. And so what type of clients do you normally have? Our typical client is more so on the commercial side, and then we do have a sprinkle of state and local customers as well. Um, and on underneath commercial, we also have um, great expertise and experience where we started, which is in the nonprofit sector. And what made you start your company? What made me start the company was customer service. You know, being being able to provide um, customer service in a tech world is can be very challenging. Um, it's it's a high skill set sometimes to learn and keep up with all the different things with customers. And so one of the things that um, I enjoy to do personally is provide the best service. So that's kind of been our mainstay and some of the kind of portions of what we do underneath all the technology and technical things that we do as well. So would love for you to talk about like when you started your business. So you've been in this game for a really long time. Yes. Um, actually, I um, started a company directly out of uh, college and um, thought I'd take a chance. Um, and then if I didn't make it, I still had time to find a job somewhere. Um, but I took a chance on myself. And, you know, again, one of the challenges I bumped into is just poor service, you know, poor service when it comes to technology, poor service provided to me. And instead of getting upset, being disgruntled, the idea was I can take that into my own hands and start start my own company. I enjoy technology anyway. Um, been enjoying it since I was young, 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 you know, when Texas instruments were out you know, way, way back. Um, and so since then, I decided to basically start the company. And um, and then from there, you know, started again with nonprofit. That was my, my first and just kind of blossomed from there. I remember those Texas instruments, the calculators, the TI. TI. Yeah, Texas instruments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. So. Yes, um, and it's pretty impressive to be able to come out of school starting your company right away. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're younger, I feel like you have less apprehension. You're, you know, you're open to trying new things. Um, and so, and, and like you said, you have the opportunity to choose. If you need to go down a different direction, you can. Yeah. So that's definitely very impressive. Was there something that um, inspired you to say, I want to start a company directly out of college? Um, you know, and I guess to to be kind of um, clear on a couple things, I mean, even in college, there were a lot of things I did on my own. I had an entrepreneurial spirit to really help, right? And so 
uh, it was just natural to kind of take that next step. I mean, I sold everything, you know, technology. Um, I can make a, make a newsletter for you. I can help design something for you. Um, my minor was, you know, uh, graphic design. So I was helping people, you know, kind of start um, websites, you know, so basic things. So I was doing that anyway. And so just the opportunity to possibly provide the services for other customers was a little bit exciting. And again, I didn't know, I didn't know any better <laughs> back then. And so I decided to give it a, give it a shot and see what happens, you know? Um, yeah. So it, it, um, you know, once you start that journey, you're just like, okay, I'm, I got to keep going. I got to keep going. So, so yes, I've been doing it for quite some time. Again, passion and technology from the beginning, um, nothing has changed. Um, I was clear about that, you know, very early on. And so that probably would inspire me to just jump out and do it. And, you know, there were people against it. There were people that thought it was like, what's your real job? I mean, I actually had people ask me that. And it was sad, actually, from my point of view, because that is my job. That's what I do. This is my passion. So what do you mean? And so, yeah. I think that when you have that entrepreneurial sp spirit, you're open to trying different lanes. I also had similar experiences where people were just kind of unsure of Amy, like, what are you doing? Right. Um, I remember um, I started a bartending company. Um, but to your point, though, right, there are so many things that you can do even at a young age. Like I was doing hair and getting paid for it in high school. Um, there were so many little things that I would do to try to find a way to make money. And not everyone's going to not everyone's going to get it to yeah. your point. And you just got to, if you know, if you're clear about it, you just got to keep pushing forward. Yeah, despite it all. Definitely. Absolutely. And don't don't uh, switch paths for anyone because you're the one. I mean, at the end of the day, this is pretty much what I use every day is that I have to be the one to go to sleep and be comfortable with the decisions I make. Not that someone else told me to make them. Right. So right. absolutely. Absolutely. So what would be some of some advice that you would give to someone who is starting a business? Um, I guess if someone's starting a business is, I guess, uh patience and if money is your first driver probably you will want to start with trying to find funding for your business um because a lot of times in business it, it takes a lot of patience um a lot of learning you know from my experience i felt like i maybe made the wrong decision only because i didn't have that on the job training right getting in an environment understanding how business should work versus what i'm doing <laughs> So the on the job without the kind of experience felt a little odd sometimes um, and felt like I was missing something. And so I felt like I was on a slow train to somewhere, but not sure. You know, So um, so I would say in starting a business, just kind of having the patience, um, the focus. And again, just really not letting anyone kind of change your mind on what what your decisions are and then be ready to make the full time commitment. You know, I have a lot of friends and colleagues that are not yet there and kind of nervous about it but i i don't you know the thing is um if you set yourself out to do it you're gonna make it happen and so for those people to be confident in that um it, it's tons of things to be done out here you need a lot of help so so we need you you know right agreed um and i think that for people who may be kind of apprehensive because that cushion of having a job feels good right but i think it's important also to have a vision um, to have focus and to say, like to be committed to knowing that at some point you got to jump off <laughs> that ledge, right? And yeah. go full throttle. Um, Cause that's really the only way that you're, in my opinion, that's the only way that you're really going to make your business successful um, is if you kind of give it your all. Um, but also, I mean, I get the real world of, I got to pay bills too, yeah. right? So the sacrifice then um, is, okay, I need to maybe um, work a bit more, um, just a bit more hours until I get to the point where I can shift my focus um, yeah. onto the business fully. Long nights, long hours. <laughs> exactly. And again, don't be afraid to fail. You know, failure, you know, when we hire people and we tell them if you, you know, screw up a computer or, or destroy something, I'm excited. That excites me because I know that you're failing to learn. And those mm -hmm. things that don't expect to happen again, right? But that's how you learn. And so I guess through my on the job training, you know, I bumped into a lot of different roads and made a lot of things very complicated for myself, um, not knowing which way to go, but I learned a lot as well. And so I thought that was very valuable. And people just think I'm a sometimes a superstar and kind of a brainiac. Not really. I've just been through a lot of things, you know. So that's that's sort of the, the thing about it. I'm not the smartest person in the world. It's just that when you go through things and learn through failure or through challenges 
that makes you even stronger and better. So I, I believe that's a good thing. And some people are afraid of that. And I think that's the, the hard part about that change into your full-time business. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And so has there been a particular experience where maybe you um, didn't necessarily expect something in particular to happen or I really wish someone would have given me this advice or, or told me about this thing before it happened to prepare myself? Like, did something catch you off guard? And if so, how did you come out of that experience? Um, so I guess, you know, one of the things that I, I guess I've, and sometimes in business, I think people think, and I guess there is some type of order to things, mm -hmm. but maybe this thing to think about is there no, there's no necessary order um, necessarily. I mean, there is some guides to kind of follow things like that, but um, the idea is to serve our customers, right? And to be able to do that, you're going to, you know, just with the needs themselves, they kind of actually, I guess, add to what is it next I need to do, right? What's that next step? When I go after contracts, I look at things and say, well, what insurances do I need? Well, now, based on this new business, I'm going to need X. And so I didn't know. I thought I should have that at first. Well, no, not necessarily. You can wait until you get that opportunity. So a lot of things I did were a little bit too early, which were some mistakes. Um, I didn't realize um, certain certifications time out and I did not have the bandwidth to make them work for me. And so that's kind of a challenge too. So I just wish that I knew that because now it would be fantastic. <laughs> but you learn to pivot from that and you learn to make um, change with that and you find partners, collaborate, right? You find your friends that can help you do the things that you're kind of, um, it timed out for you, but maybe not for them. And so you learn, learn to adapt, right? I did kind of mess that up a little bit, but I adapted to that change, that that issue, right? So, um, so yeah. So I, I just wish I knew. Sometimes I feel like there there are steps that I might have, but again, I feel like also there are no steps. So it's like this kind of divide where you you just feel like you're in the middle and you're not sure which way to go. So that's a good, that's a really good example. Mm -hmm. You have to have certain business insurance depending on the type of customers you have. For example, we've had a hospital as a as a client, and they're very stringent on the type of insurance requirements that we needed to have. So you got to go back to your insurance carrier and say, I need this. I need that. I need to get those certificate of insurance documents because sometimes they also want to be listed um, on the certificate. Yeah. But then and if you're going to give them that certificate, it's going to expire, right? Because your policy is usually for a year and you have to stay on top of not only paying the premium, but then also reissuing those new certifi certificates to them. So that's a really, really good point yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just order. What's for, And I've had even colleagues come up to me and ask, you know, what was the time to do this? So I need to get this and I need to get that. But, you know, take your time. Like, what's the priorities? Figure those out. And, you know, as a young person, I had a lot of time on my hand and I wasn't that busy because I didn't have that many customers. So I just kept getting stuff. And at some points, like, wait a minute, do I really need that? Do I really need this? I need to focus on that. So trying to prioritize too is really important. Um, and then those things will come, you know, um, they will come. So you'll you'll know when. <laughs> so, There's a big client asking you for something and you have to go get that. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Can you share a success story where your company helped another business achieve their goals? Yes, um, small thing, but a good thing. Um, again, I talk about collaboration. And so one of the things, um, the same thing that happened to me kind of was happening to another colleague where um, there's a specific certification when you get your 8A, for example, which is a federal mm -hmm. certified, um, and their certification was expiring. Well, my other colleague just got their certification. And so the idea was, you know what? Maybe you two can parlay and collaborate as you're, offboarding your certification, talk to your client, get them to introduce to my new, my other um, colleague, and then you two can work together, keep the contract, right? Work together. My, it satisfied both my, um, because one of the things with 8A, you want to have past performance, right? But your new 8A, you didn't even know where to go get the business. That takes time in itself. And so now I've just given you business right there from an existing colleague that was graduating. So I felt like that was very helpful. At least I thought I was being helpful, <laughs> um, but it did give past performance and it's always helpful to have past performance. Um, and so I thought that was a very good value and I was glad to pay attention, listen to you know both people say, well, I, you know, I'm losing this, wait a minute, somebody just got theirs. So I had to pay very close attention to that. I thought that was a great thing. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of proud of that. You know, I was able to be helpful. And again, she's got another 8A 
work from that. So that, that's been good. Yeah, that's awesome. And as you hear that too, right? You hear about those relationships in the federal government space where um, you can partner up with other companies that has a certification that you need. And that's a great way to build your business while you're trying to get, it could be that you're trying to get those certifications for yourself. Or like you said, a company's graduating, I'm trying to get in the door. How do we merge the two together so that we both win? Exactly, why lose, why lose the business, right? You already have the relationship and they, they need that vehicle to continue business sometimes um, to make their work easier as we know. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So how is your company um, supporting organizations with staying up to date with the latest technology trends and development? There are tons of updates all the time. Um, how does your company help? It is crazy. Um, it's a moving target that has sped up over the last five years. It was moving at a you know manageable pace. You know, I can keep up with it, do a little things here and there. Um, but now it's just like gas pedal down. <laughs> so, so I would say, I mean, one of the things that we've, you know, I've always believed in is kind of just making people aware so they can make better decisions um, about the tools they're using, maybe change the tools they're using, um, but they need to know what's out there. And so these little, I call them these little tech shows or tech showcase. You know, I sometimes will do those with our, our team and, you know, my different teams and what they do is like, look, we need to tell people about this. How can this benefit them, whether they use it or not? Maybe, but they do have information now and they are aware of what they can do versus what they've been doing all the time. So trying to keep them up to, to speed with what, what the latest, greatest things that we're learning about is out there and how it might be able to help their businesses and also talking to other businesses, maybe in the same industry or space to see if there are things that could possibly parlay into their business and better leverage technology for them as well. So what is a tech showcase? What does that consist of? So a tech showcase is basically the things that we do, you know, for our customers, we show it off. You know, we have vendors that come in and we come talk about this particular new product we sell. So we just became a, um, um, we just were working on a partnership with a specific uh, AV vendor and we bought them in and say, look, let's have a, we have a demo room. Take a look at what this technology does. When you walk in, it knows the meeting you have. It turned on the screen. It put the shades down, turned the, you know, the mics on. Everything is ready for you, right? We've set up a control system where these things are just controlled by you. As soon as you walk in, they, you know, the system sees your device and they're like, oh, that's Sequoia. She's here for a meeting. I know what meeting that is because it's in our Outlook calendar. Everything pops up automatically. So being able to demonstrate some of the things that we're getting involved in now, some of the new partnerships we've made in technology to better help our customers, right? So we've been spending a lot of time kind of up in our game as far as new relationships, you know, new products, things like that, and additional services to our customers, and then showing it off to them, um, either coming to them, um, you know, right at their site, having a little lunch and learn, or doing a showcase at our office. That sounds good. I like that. Mm -hmm. I like the effortless ness of that <laughs> where you walk into a room and it knows you and everything is just exactly the way that you would want it to be um so that's a really really good example of innovation um that i haven't even heard of yet mm -hmm. you have any other stories you want to share <laughs> <laughs> like what else are you working on <laughs> i mean that that's one of them and again just building those um building those partnerships with the new tools. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot, you know, and, um, you know, I know the buzzwords like AI and things like that have made some of these things happen. And what I'm excited about or what I was learning when I was way back in the day, you know, with my Texas Instruments, um, they did have Dr. Sabetso from IBM, which was kind of the little baby AI that they were doing 20, 15, 20 years ago. But I was trying to tell it things to do, which is not as smart but I've always been intrigued by that type of thing. And so I'm, I'm waiting for the uh, humanoid robots to come out. Mm. <laughs> so, and so AI is kind of the beginning, the beginning far center of that, that process. So um, it's going to be exciting. I know they're there now. Um, they just have to get a little smarter, but uh, yeah, I'm excited about that. that's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah. So. Yeah. Those look a little creepy. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I, all this stuff is creepy and it's like, you know, it's always what I've wanted, but then now that it's come to life, it's like very weird. <laughs> <laughs> but to your point though, right. I think that like, it kind of takes me back to years ago or decades ago where we saw in the movies, these things that are now happening, right. Self-driving cars. I remember total recall. Do you remember that movie? 
I do remember that movie. Hey, why don't you go back to something real basic? The Jetsons. <laughs> oh my God. The Jetsons. The Jetsons. <laughs> yes. The Jetsons. They were the coolest. But that was like, wow, that is crazy what they were thinking right. about. Right? That was crazy. <laughs> exactly. And now it's and now it's here. Yeah, right. That's it's here. Amazing. So how do you think that uh, technology is impacting industries outside of traditional tech sectors, such as like healthcare, education? Well, that's been interesting because we have clients in these spaces and I feel like it's a game changer. And it's um, it's been very helpful. I mean, now data is centralized. Um, we, you know, we still have some work to do. <laughs> There's still things that need to be streamlined. But I, I think that this is a good direction. Um, when we're trying to be all connected. Um, and so with the things like how COVID happened, things like that, it reminded us that we do have to have other ways. I mean, we just can't be subject to the manual process of things. Um, but I think we just have to, you know, the impact is also, we always have got to watch the, the spin as well, right? So what's the negative? How can we kind of protect, you know, because now doctors are keen on a keyboard instead of looking at me and helping me, they're, they're now being kind of, forced to use this thing where they have to record all the time and they're doing data and all this stuff. So it's just trying to find that balance and how do we make all this work and not lose focus on on us, on human, you know, and that's, the, I think, the tough part. And I'm trying, and actually, it's kind of funny. Um, I'm preparing for my, um, my summer internship program. And some of the things I plan to talk about are specific around that, like, guys, don't let AI take you away. I mean, you have to show your human side, right? So there's certain things that we need to do better to make sure that this guy doesn't take over. I mean, it's like, don't be a bot, right? You be a person, you know, and, and, you know, have those soft skills, right? The things that that bot has to learn and figure out, you have them, right? And so, so I'm trying to make sure that there's, there's that both sides of the coin, you know, type of thing. Um, because, you know, I talked to my clients too, where they just want to be um, medical technician, you know, just want to do practitioners on what they do and not all this technology, but we need the information as well, right? So it's a balance, that's what I think. The impact is real, but it's tilted a little. We need to continue to balance it out, which it's hard, so not many wanna do it. <laughs> so. Yeah, and it's like, you see some people that are open to the new technology, AI, again, we hear, we're hearing about it every single day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some people are kind of adverse to it, but it's like, at the end of the day, I feel like with our roles in tech, it's how do we leverage something to be more efficient? How do we be more productive? And I get what you're saying about the doctors and now they're no longer looking at you and they're typing in the, in the, on the keyboard or in a laptop. And But then the other piece, the flip side is now they're putting all their notes in the system. They don't have to remember to put the notes in later on, which is an inefficiency. Um, and you so, know what I gonna happen so here's the thing here's maybe and here's maybe let me say the maybe here's yeah. maybe the balance with ai okay with co-pilots and i'm just using co-pilot not you know kind of in quotes <laughs> not using that term but if the doctor had that they could maybe put that down talk to me and work with me this mm. guy over here this ai guy this co-pilot guy can take all the notes and deal with that right so sure. that's what i'm hoping you know again we continue to look at but with everything, both sides of the coin, right? Um, don't just lean, like make sure we're always balancing not to go too far. And like you said, to that scary point as well, right? we're doing too much one way or the other. And it's, you know, with human beings, we're a little strained sometimes and we do too much of things, but I think if we should always find balance and so. True, figure out a way to merge it together to make it great. Exactly. Absolutely. So what about, the role of technology um, just as it relates to the workplace? Like, how do you see, because you work with clients, like, do you see them embracing the technology? Do you see that they're still struggling with technology um, in their organizations? Like, what does that look like for the, um, the worker, especially after a pandemic and people being kind of like forced to now <laughs> use technology on a regular basis? You know what? I've been around for a little bit. <laughs> so, um, for me, I feel like now the embrace is better, right? Mm -hmm. Our senior, our senior counterparts are getting used to it. It's a part of their process, right? And we kind of unfortunately shoved it a little bit, but I think it was all for the better, right? Um, I remember when Social Security got rid of paper checks. That was rough. I mean, that was a nightmare for a lot, right? 
but they electronically drop those into the account and you got to work with it. Right. And so um, and so I think that, you know, for, for me, I think people are grasping a little bit better. Um, we just have to continue our efforts again with that balance. So when we understand digital divide and where people don't have things to kind of do all the things that you know, everybody else can do, find that balance where we can give them some tools. And I think we're doing that and we're trying our best to. So people are paying attention. Like we're going really fast this way, but you left a couple of folks behind. So um, I feel like they're trying their best to continue to balance that out, which then allows for more adoption, right? If you can do it, if you have the tools to do it. So, so. Right. So do you find um, certain approaches work for specific people in the organization that are maybe like slower to embrace the technology? Yeah, just handholding. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it's it. Hoping it's what's in it for me. Sometimes you have to find the what's in it for them approach to get them to embrace it. If you can maybe explain, oh, this is going to take, I don't know, 10 steps off of your workload and it means that you can be doing the things that you love doing, then they might say, oh, okay, I think I like it now. <laughs> and guess what else, Amy? This is a funny thing. Failure. I've heard so many times that people say, I'm scared I'm going to screw something up. So what? Screw it up. It's a computer. We're computer people. We'll fix it. So it's just this thing where people have to get comfortable. And it's like us too. Like when we're in business, right? fail so what that's the good thing that's the good part matter of fact if you're not failing you're probably not doing something right so the good thing is it's time to fail right um that way you learn and so i have to and i just actually this is a recent you know situation where somebody just wasn't confident at all and they just said i just i'm always i'm just gonna click the wrong thing and the window's gonna move okay i thought i wouldn't give you another computer i don't care we can get another computer there's so many out here in the world we don't mind <laughs> so don't worry about it Right. And so we can give them that. Don't worry about it. They kind of tiptoe along and, you know, click that, click that. And they'll speed up knowing that it's OK. It's OK. I think, yeah, I think that's what it is. And so the more you do that and I notice when that that, you know, again, providing the support that we do and having the patience that we have, um, I think that's important. And so for me, making them understand making a mistake is a part of learning this thing. This computer is glued with a bunch of vendors all together trying to figure out how to make something work. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Restart it. <laughs> it like, you know, I mean, there's ways around it. Let's put it that way, right? We go through right. this every so. Right. And we're usually coaching people up on using SharePoint and they'll say, well, I don't, I, I, I might break the site. I said, you can break it, we'll fix it. But at least if you break it, we know that you're actually using it and we want you to use it. So go ahead and break it, it's fine. That's how you're gonna learn. To right. use it. Yeah. Absolutely. Just push the button. <laughs> push it. Exactly. So as the president of the company, what do you think are the valuable skill sets that you would have on your team in order to support your clients? Oh, the skill set of the team? Yeah, like you said the hand holding part. So that means they have to have patience. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Good listeners, right? Mm. Um, I feel like people are telling you what the problem is or what they need or what the obstacle is. And you just have to hear that. That way you have the right answer, right? So if you listen well enough, you can figure that out. Um, so I think that's good. Um, and I think, you know, the interesting part about what we do is technical or your technical skills might be next to the third or fourth thing that's important, right? Mm. <laughs> so I feel like the other things are, are a lot more important. I think communication is really hard these days with technology. Again, that balance, you know. So I believe they have to be good communicators. Um, and most of the time, people just want to know what you're up to. What are you doing? You're on my computer. What are you up to? <laughs> you know. So communicating with them um, as you're supporting them, so they kind of understand what's going on. Um, and I think that is most of your obstacle, right? And so most things are not technical. It's just getting through that user need and some of those challenges that you need to do, and and you're good to go. And um, again, what like what I like what I said, be ready to fail. That That's another uh, skill set that I tell them. It's not, you know, it's funny when you're doing interviews, you know, people are thinking, like, what's the right answer? What's the right answer? Nope, I'm not looking for the right answer. Um, matter of fact, I have people that try so hard that they actually don't tell the right answer. They're making something up, which is not good, right? We could always um, tell. 
<laughs> yeah, so so those are the things that I feel like uh, for a good team, you know, in this industry uh, for me that I need um, to have is that that's going to be really, really important. Right. And um, yeah. All right. So flip side of that, from a business perspective, um, what are some good qualities in uh, leadership? is uh, needed being a leader i mean i feel like leading a team you know my job is to elevate people um and making sure they grow which is very interesting because sometimes you feel like do you really want to grow or not <laughs> you know so um and sometimes it's a challenge right mm -hmm. a continual thing that i you know we do and try to push people to and then i have colleagues that'll say well they take all this stuff you teach them all this stuff and then they leave i don't think about that um yeah. That's not really important. I mean, it's important that you're elevating someone um, and making them valuable because if you do valuable and have, you know, um, if you do that, it's going to be helpful for, to the company. That's going to be helpful to them. And again, it makes them feel like we, we care and we know. We're, so that's kind of really important for me, you know, as a leader to make sure I'm doing those things. Um, and then really being a good example as well, right? I, I try to drink the same Kool Aid that they do, <laughs> you know, so the things that I say other things typically I'm doing, right? So I want to make sure that um, uh, I'm kind of open as far as that goes. And I'm, I, you know, the things that I, that I give them to do, I've, and I tell them sometimes I've done all this stuff, you guys have done everything, you know, and some leaders have, some haven't, but for me, it's good to always say, oh, I've, I've been there, I've been, and then understanding that, really understanding that. So I give them all these tasks to do, and they're like, but I have to do this and this and that, and I've done that before. But I do have to balance that because it is tough, and I get what you're saying. I've oh, been yeah. in the field. I've worked directly with clients. I've done, I've done these things before, so I know, um, I know the challenges, right? And so, being able to, um, you know, kind of work with them on those things as well. And I think that's such a good blend, right? Where you're a business owner, but then you also have that technical knowledge, so you understand what's involved for what they're trying to accomplish. And I think it it's good because then you can help guide um, decision points. Um, mm -hmm. You can push things forward. And the worst thing ever is when a technical team gets set up, right? Like I've seen in corporate America where the technical teams, they are thrown some project with unrealistic expectations because the executive folks just didn't have a clue as to what they were agreeing to. And now... You know, it, it doesn't, it's not a good feeling for the, the people who receive uh, the brunt work of, of that type of experience. Yeah, that makes sense, Amy. Now that, you think, now that I think about it, because, you know, one of the other things we want to do is set our team up for success, right? We want to try to make them successful, but there are certain things that you have to do for that. You know, I have to make sure I have the right tools in place, right? The right mentors, people for them to talk to. Um, I have to sometimes be available. So just really making sure that they understand that um, I want them to be successful. That's the key. Um, and so we have goals as a company as well. We made them a part of those goals. And so we understand they have some as well. And so we want to kind of understand what that looks like and really, you know, try our best to try my best to uh, make sure they understand that that's what I want. And I, and I have people stay and people go, but it's always good to see when they go, wow, they're doing some great things too. You know, the things they learn, things they're growing to. So although it's sad, you know, things do change and there's nothing we can do about that. Um, that's human nature. That's just how the world works. So the good thing is, wow, look at where you are now. Look at what you're doing now. So it's, it's always exciting to see those things um, and how the successes. So. Absolutely. And I feel like, you know, based on you saying like, I'm going to make sure I'm supportive and give them everything that they need to be successful yes they may you know learn a lot and move on but at the end of the day it's like as a business owner if you're doing everything that you're supposed to do to support your team you don't feel any kind of way about it right because you're doing what you're supposed to do <laughs> i mean we had people come back we had people refer people with i mean it's just a good feeling to have you know again the positivity of kind of elevating you know people just period you know and so um you know, it is, it is what it is, but it's always a good thing to feel that part of it, you know, and it's growth. That's what I've always wanted. Right. So, um, whether, whatever way it goes, that's what we want. So, um, that's a good thing. And again, we do a lot of work with interns too. So we understand that that's a part of the, the growing pains in the, in the path. Yes. So the internship program, um, how, what does that look like? A lot of work for me. <laughs> Looks like a lot. <laughs> High school, college. Are you going to, yeah. yeah. 
there's high schools with programs, career programs that allow the students to work half, is it a half day or some days full um, at job sites, which is really cool at high school level. And um, so we have a blend of, of high school and college level. So it's actually a bunch of, um, and we set up the programs for them to be a part of a team. Um, we've now instituted certifications, right, where we help them get certified. It's something they can take along with them. So that's very important. It also helps us, right, to get um, certified team members on our, our team. And then we connect them, you know, our goal is to connect them with mentors, people in the company that do this every day, and then actually have them work with customers, right? Actually work with customers, which is kind of your hands on on the job training where people learn their best. So it works out well. All right, I'm gonna have to get some pointers from you later on because I'm thinking about starting an internship program because a few people have asked me about it. I just need yeah. to know what that looks like. It's fantastic, do it. It's it, there's a there's a couple little tricks of the trade, but we're changing ours up a little bit just to be a little bit more supportive and more structured in how we want to do things. Get the the, the leadership, you know, either um, managers involved so that they are kind of really understanding that process as well, and carving it out in a really structured program and then kind of evaluating and just a lot of things. Um, and yeah, it, it's a good thing. And for those that are in Maryland, they actually offer, at least in STEM, dollars to put towards your internship. So there's no reason why you should not have an internship program, right? They're gonna help pay for it. Why not, right? And other states may do it as well. I'm just familiar with Maryland and they have one um, through the UMBC Career Center program. I was just at UMBC for an engineering event with my child. Good to know, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Um, I definitely will connect with you later on offline about that. It was such a pleasure having you today. You dropped a lot of gems. Thank you so much for joining me. How can the audience get in contact with you? You can get in contact with me via LinkedIn. We have um, a site, we have a LinkedIn, um, link through our company, Realistic Computing, as well as me directly, um, feel free to reach out. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate the invite. No problem at all. Thanks for joining.